Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy that, uh, to be with you today. My name is Sarit Zavi. I'm the CEO and founder of Alma. This is Monday afternoon, and uh, we meet again. This is our third webinar in Alma, and I'm extremely proud uh, to be with you today to talk a little bit about the future of the Middle East. Uh, you know, before we begin, I want to say a few words about what is happening in Alma now because ALMA was based on uh, tours or meeting face to face and now uh, we need to connect uh, in a different uh, aspect in a different way which is webinars and digital but uh, we have gone through a process in the past month and I guess that today all ALMA's uh, educational programs are accessible uh, digitally surprisingly enough including our uh, tours on the borders uh, we have learned a lot in the past months, not only about COVID-19, but also about what could be done uh, digitally. And we understand that everything could be done. Uh, so I invite all of you not only to join us to the next hour or half an hour, but also to be in touch later on uh, so we can discuss uh, what else uh, we can do in order to have Alma continue providing uh, all that information that it used to provide from the borderline uh, to you. So today I'm extremely proud and honored to have with us uh, two very distinguished uh, guests. Uh, they're not really guests, actually they're family. Uh, Ilan Levy is a Brigadier General with Reserves in the IDF. He served for 32 years uh, in the IDF. Most of his, in his time he fought in Lebanon. He was a commander of two armored brigades, Arel and Barak. And he also served <clears throat> part of the time as my commander in reserve, uh, the head of the operation division in the Northern Command. Uh, uh, between the years uh, 2013 to 2015, by the way, the formative years of a new strategy in the Syrian border. Eric Mandel, Dr. Eric Mandel, is the director of mapping the Middle East Political Information uh, Network. He regularly briefs members of U.S. Congress, uh, Senate and House, uh, and their follow, uh, pro foreign policy advisors. Uh, hi, Eric. Thank you for being with us today. Great to be here with you. Uh, he is the senior editor uh, for security uh, at the Jerusalem Report as well. And Eric published a, a lot of interesting pieces about what's going on in the Middle East and uh, policy papers uh, in mapping in Jerusalem Post in the Hill. Uh, we are following, and again, uh, I'm extremely honored to have us with you today. Um, so today, you know, when we build this program of, about, of webinars, we thought that uh, it was a month ago, like it looks like it was years ago, and we thought that a month ahead, we will already know we will already know where this is going we will already understand the trends not only globally but also regionally and uh, i think that today we understand that there is a big uh, question mark uh, where this is going and we would like to begin with understanding first <clears throat> the areas the region of the middle east we understand that we can point of four groups of uh, states which are the Sunni states or the countries that Israel has this or that kind of relationship with uh, openly or not openly whether it's Egypt and Jordan or Saudi Arabia and Gulf countries the second group is <clears throat> Palestinian Authority and Gaza and the third group is what we call the Shiite axis Lebanon Syria Iraq uh, all three are headed by Iran, and we can also add Turkey as a player for itself. And uh, each of these four has different interests, different trends, and even different ways uh, to take care of their own interests during this crisis of the COVID-19. So I think that my first question, and I would love you know, if you can uh, begin, is, are we already there at that day 
after the COVID-19 crisis or we have just started? Can we already point at the trend of whether there's gonna be peace in the Middle East or any implication uh, to this crisis? You want me to begin, Sarit? Yes, I would love to. Okay, uh, good evening uh, and I'm happy to, to uh, be here. Uh, I think that the first and most uh, important thing that we understand during this short period that looks like a very long one is that cooperation is needed all over the world. Okay, if I may say the new trend is the trend of cooperation. There is no possibility to cross this challenge without cooperation between the nations and between the superpower over the world. If that won't be understand, then we will be inside the corona for more and more long time. Now, looking inside to our area, I think that the, the understanding of the need of cooperation between us and our uh, neighbors is mostly regarding the Palestinian issue. And I think that we have quite a good cooperation with the Palestinians, first of all, because we understand that the corona doesn't have any borders and it can cross between us to them. And second, because of the understanding of the Palestinians that they need us in order to overcome the big challenge ahead of them. Regarding to other countries, that's a, another issue. Uh, of course, to say cooperation between us and our enemies will be a too high sentence, but I think if I may say the cooperation as I can see, is the understanding that they shouldn't challenge us and we should think twice if we should challenge them. Meaning to say, everybody now will deal inside its own problem, trying to contain the problems inside their homes. I think that is the basic motivation for the short period ahead, okay? To talk about the long period, it will be quite a challenge now, but we can see that there is an understanding all over this area that everyone should try to contain, to solve, to go ahead uh, in trying to fight the common enemy. Okay, so let's say just a few words about how everybody in this Middle East is fighting uh, this battle. And you know, when I'm comparing the Middle East to Europe, I see that it looks like there is almost no corona, no COVID-19 in the Middle East. Actually, uh, when we're looking at the, uh, at the websites and the reports of the World Health Organization, we see that in each of these states in the Middle East, there are maybe tens and maybe hundreds of infected people and very few people uh, uh, died uh, from the virus until today. It looks like it's a non-issue, allegedly, of course. Uh, yet, in most of these countries, there is, in one way or another, lockdown. People are told to stay at home. In some of the places, they are obliged to stay at home. Uh, the health system and the government are a part of the battle to provide food to help the people in, in this way or another in all of these countries. So they do take part in this um, crisis. They are affected by the crisis, especially economically, but very little uh, medically. Eric, would you like to relate how come there is hardly Corona, COVID-19 in the Middle East? I will say, don't believe it. Um, because when you're dealing with authoritarian regimes, um, they do not want, especially Iran in this case, which is the epicenter of coronavirus in the Middle East, they are likely to have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cases, 
and they have been hiding it and they've been late to the game. And we really don't know exactly what's there. Um, Turkey um, recently just had a three day, a weekend a lockdown, but everybody got together in, in the supermarkets right before. Um, Syria, you know, when you have all of these places that don't have an infrastructure of really good healthcare, um, and on top of the calamity that was going on in some of these places, Lebanon, more than half the population is under the poverty line. So that's, that's one part. So I would take all of that with a large grain of salt, except for Israel, of course, which, which is always the except for Israel. It's a first world country in a third world area. I want to just flip around um, um, what the general was talking about, where he started specifically and then went more macro. I want to do macro and then calm down. The question really here in the long term, are we dealing with something that's game changing here? Are we going to be heading into a downward spiral on top of a calamity? Our friend Yossi Kupavasa, um, former head of uh, um, research for military intelligence, says, no, this is a, a pause and things are going to start bad again. Uh, I'm not sure, um, but I just want to mention two things and I'll give it back to you. One is Syria, which is, which is your bailiwick, um, is Russia, Iran, Turkey going to remain as engaged? And, in, and what will happen with COVID running maybe as a wildfire through Idlib? and with the refugee crisis. The other part which I would love to emphasize is Iran. How is Iran going to deal with this? And Iran, I believe, will look at this as a place to gain an advantage. It, will, it is already doing that. It's continuing its nuclear work. Um, it is attacking American troops that have moved into a defensive position. Our friends um, Jonathan Spire and, and Seth Franzman have been writing about that. And the head of the Iran um, energy organization, Ali Akbar Saleh, said, quote, and this is during the COVID crisis, a new generation of centrifuges will come online soon at Nataz. And so they are not stopping. And um, Israel can't stop. And granted, our focus is off. What my job in, in the States is, is to try to get American foreign policy officials not to take their eyes off the ball in the Middle East. Okay, so in a minute, we're going to get to the United States. But first, Ilan, and since Eric already mentioned the nuclear issue and how Iran is going to take advantage of all of that, uh, I personally don't believe that uh, Iran is going to leave uh, Syria following the, uh, the crisis, and neither does Russia. We see that the militias are still coming in. We see that El Bukamal border crossing between Iraq and Syria is still active and open, though there are tons of dilemmas of how exactly to do that, but the, the area is still open. Uh, the flights are less flights, but they are still continuing. So I personally believe that uh, the processes that we have seen before uh, the crisis will continue afterwards. Uh, Ilan, I would love to hear your opinion about how uh, all of that is going to implicate the, the threats against Israel from this, what we call Shiite axis. Well, the, the basic interests are the same basic interests as before the coronavirus spread, okay? But I think the capability to fulfill those interests or those intentions uh, is more difficult now. So I think that for the short period, the coming, let's say, three to six months, a period that will be inside this crisis, as I said in the beginning, we will see the countries, the organizations, the uh, other uh, powers around this area uh, dealing inside their basic problems. Okay, it doesn't say that Iran won't continue to. Uh, uh, try to reach the bomb, okay? Again, Iran is a 90 million people uh, country. So how many people are dealing with the issue of the, the nuclear? Maybe some thousands. And they are well protected by the regime, not only from the corona, from all the lots of, of other reasons. So the basic interest will continue. I think that we won't see for now any changes or any intentions to create situations around the borders, except if things regarding Gaza, again, Gaza, 
as in the usual days uh, will happen. So over there, we can see some, some struggles, but again, I don't see something that is going to be changed too radically for the coming period. Even the world won't see it in a positive way. No one wants to deal with wars when you have a, a third world war. That's some kind of a third world war, okay? So nobody wants those noises uh, around the area. And I think that people around us are enough uh, smart to understand this, uh, this issue. What about uh, the internal stability of uh, these countries? Eric, you wrote uh, a piece about that, and you said that uh, the COVID-19 might undermine the stability of many uh, dictatorships in the region, beginning from Egypt and uh, going all the way to Iran. Uh, since, as you said, there is an industry of concealing, uh, since uh, the, the health system cannot actually uh, cope with this kind of huge crisis if many people will get sick. Do you still believe that this is actually possible, that the, the, the regime in Iran may fall thanks to COVID-19, or that ISIS may uh, 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 succeed in taking over uh, uh, areas in Iraq or in Syria? Well, first of all, I'm humble enough to realize that I was in the Middle East when the Arab winter began and I had no clue what was happening. So, uh, you know, and I don't think any, I was with experts and they had no clue that it was happening. So we have to realize that what we say are best guesstimates of what's here and what we really want is to be able to think of all the contingencies and how to deal with them. Israel is better at it than my nation. Um, so that's the first thing. So in theory, if regimes get weakened, hey, maybe Iran could become weakened. There were already protests going on there. Iraq, there were protests against the Iranian-controlled Iraqi militias, the popular mobilization, Yunus Qatar, Hezbollah. And maybe this could lead to a more pro-Western orientation or less that they'll look more inward. Unintended con consequences more likely make more chaos and anarchy and are filled with the ISIS type of characters that are out there. I think we have to worry about every regime. We've already had a situation before. It's obviously, Syria was a basket case economically. Lebanon has been a basket case. Iraq, Iran with the sanctions. But from an American perspective, Jordan and Egypt, when people are not gonna be able to be fed, when a epidemic is a pandemic, which, which goes that they can't control and they lose faith, that's when people, even in an authoritarian regime, will come out. And how it's going to play out, we really don't know, which means this is a more dangerous world. It's not, I don't see better. Yes, we could spin this. Maybe there's some opportunities for cooperation, um, but I look at it less likely. I think about it, previous cooperation, for example, between Israelis and Palestinians when there was the horrific forest fire up north in Israel and the Palestinian firefighters were there. But, you know, and we say, well, maybe this is a place where we can move forward. Kogad is doing amazing things, you know, with Gaza, but yet we hear the Palestinian prime minister talk about Israeli soldiers infecting Palestinians purposely. I'm, I'm more um, a negative than Alan, I think, about that. And I think that's a better way to approach it. Expect the worst and hope for the best. Okay, so I want to say a few words about that. Um, beginning with Jordan and Egypt. Yes, we always have to worry about Jordan and Egypt. And yet, since, and though the concealing and everything, since uh, the crisis as for now, and again, it's the Middle East, we don't know exactly, uh, the COVID-19 is keep on surprising us everywhere, but uh, if it will continue the way it is today, it feels like the governments are handling it. It feels like the government can cope with that, and it's possible. Moreover, the, the COVID-19 brings people to stay at home. How can you make a revolution without street protest, without popular protest, without, without going outside? This is a much more difficult. And we've seen that the protest that was already going on in Iraq, in Lebanon, and in Iran was stopped by the COVID-19, by the crisis, by the call of everybody around the globe, stay home. In Iran, I think the situation is even more uh, complicated because we know that 
many within the Iranian people are totally against their government and they just cannot overthrow it. And I think that we need two basic things for a, a popular revolt to, to succeed. One is an option, another, an alternative. And the Iranian opposi opposition is not in Iran. And the one that is outside Iran is not capable of coming back and taking over. It, it doesn't have any systems inside Iran like Khomeini had in 1979. And second, you need the support of the army. You need somebody from inside the military system to help you do that, which again, the military system in Iran is completely loyal to the government in Iran. And that's why I think that when we speak about stability, maybe uh, it will help ISIS uh, raise up again in Iraq or in Syria. And I'm not even sure about that because I believe that COVID-19 can also damage ISIS as well, the same way it will damage the Shiite side. It doesn't matter. It, it will get there eventually. Sarit, if I may say a word. Yeah, please do. I, I again, we don't know how this, uh, this issue of the COVID-19, this great issue of the COVID-19 will influence us, but, but again, it is a change, a game changer all around the world. It's not, uh, people at home, first of all, think how they will have food for tomorrow in those countries. I hope it won't be also in Israel. So people, when they need food and they do not search for harming other people or fighting other people, okay? And people won't cooperate with no one that wants to fight in an era that they need to survive themselves. And the enemy is a common enemy for all of us. It's not now that the Iranian will hate us more. The Iranian will hate us, okay, but they will put us, you know, aside. The enemy of my enemy, you know, we know the sentence. So we have a common enemy. And I think for the coming months, for sure, for the coming year, everyone will want to understand how to survive, how to overcome, how to contain this issue. Without that, nothing will happen. So we will have to have patience. And I assume that the coming year will be a year that everyone will deal inside its own problems and challenges. Just from yeah. the medical, I was going yeah, to say, yeah. from a medical perspective, um, when, when there is a effective medical treatment, um, which could be a few months or six or 12 months, or when there's a vaccine in 12 to 18 months, um, that will probably be sort of an official end. The question here is, I really would rather lean on the side of using the time to prepare and assuming um, your adversaries are going to prepare. Um, you're there no matter what. Um, my, my inclination is um, you know, that, that you can come back into this in more of a position of strength and leverage uh, or not. Um, how you can do that ha has to be thought. It's because nobody's been through something like this, a pandemic since the Spanish through over a hundred years ago. So Eric, do you believe that there are also some opportunities or new opportunities for the United States and its policy in the Middle East following this crisis? Um, the most important thing is damage control. I always am one who talks about you should be on the offensive because when you're on the defensive, you're going to lose. America's on the defensive. America had one foot out of the door in the Middle East before this began. Americas are looking inward. We have trillions of dollars more of national debt. People are not going to understand that any foreign aid is going out. I believe that even the $3.1 billion in aid to Israel will be challenged, as will the number two and three recipients, Jordan and Egypt respectively, are gonna be challenged. And it's the worst possible thing we could do to lose our small footprint because if we're talking about creating uncertainty of destabilizing the area, it's the withdrawal of American troops. And America being on the defensive is that we've moved out of forward positions now in Iraq, and we're just sitting ducks there. And so how are we gonna respond as this goes on? 
maybe for the short term we need to do this, but we really need to be talking about a few months from now, where do we want to be? And there's really no appetite in America um, to do anything like, uh, like to remain engaged here. But maybe it's an opportunity for America like to take the time and to think where exactly do you want to be? Do you want to be in or out? And if you want to be in, how exactly do you want to be in? If you want to be out, how exactly do you do that without losing the Middle East completely? It's a presidential. The problem is we're going into a presidential election in six months. It's very hard to get anything accomplished. Just add to that the uncertainty of the COVID virus. Um, so I don't think there'll be any new initiatives that are there. Um, and we may have a different administration that's going to think totally different about the Middle East. And by the way, a Trump administration in a second term may not be anything like the first administration. We really don't know. Well, I, I, truly, hope that, uh, one minute, I truly hope that each of the uh, candidates, whoever they are, as we speak, are sitting and writing their, their own uh, approach and policy. So when we all uh, get out of this outbreak, they will be ready to implement something organized. Ilan, what did you want to add? Yeah, I want to add a, another point that's important to, to understand. When you look at Israel, although there is an internal criticism uh, about the way that the government uh, is handling the, the crisis, when you look at the wide picture, I can say that the grade that I give to my country is that uh, uh, something like a good plus, okay? That's a very important issue because it shows the way that Israel is handling crisis. It gives us more, okay, image power around us. It deters our enemies. They see that there is a country that is managing the crisis, that the a, a army is inside helping the civilian uh, uh, the civilian government to overcome that there are no many deaths not too much people are in bad shape that's a very important thing when our neighbors are looking at us and again without fighting them they understand that the people not only the government of Israel, that the people of Israel know how to cross those crises. And when the government says that everyone should be at home, people are at home. Okay? That's an important thing when you look around us. And I think that the countries around us understand that. I hope that we will continue to manage the crisis as I think in a good plus uh, grade that will help us uh, in the future confronting other challenges that we will have for sure. Okay, I don't want that yeah, no one will understand that I think that peace is coming, not at all, but uh, as I said, everyone will deal for the coming period in own internal problems before trying to challenge uh, others outside. To Elon's point, you're absolutely right about the image. There was a major article in the New York Times yesterday talking about how Mossad um, was able to help. And Americans looked at themselves and saying, my, I couldn't ask my CIA to do that. So I do believe um, if there's one nation that's image has been strong or become strong and also the innovations that have, that have come out in medical and vaccine research have made it around the world and people are reaching it. So I do believe Israel, I wish it wasn't a crisis like this to buff Israel's image, but I do think there is, that is one thing to take away. Uh, I want to wrap up what you both said, because I think it's also uh, part of, we received some questions here of, about the scenarios of this COVID-19 will come back again and again, and uh, how is this going to affect Israel's security? Uh, I totally agree that what is now happening as a great contribution to the positive image of Israel, to the message that Israel always want to uh, distribute that or to deliver that uh, we have national resilience, that we uh, has the capability to deter our enemies 
not only with what Eric, you said about the Mossad, but also with the fact that we can successfully deal with a national crisis that took everybody by surprise. Uh, and if we will be able to get through this uh, period of time in a successful way economically and medically, this will uh, be a very important message uh, for everybody else. When we, we think about image of power, we think about creating Israel as a country that has a strong deterrence uh, towards its uh, enemies, that its enemies understand what Israel, Israel has learned. And I'm saying that as an ex officer, we have learned a lot from this crisis of how to handle a future crisis if it's war and if it's conflict. Uh, best example, of course, is the IDF. The IDF is now dealing with the home front but as we speak somebody is making sure that we are safe safe from syria safe from lebanon 10 days ago there were reports in syria that idf uh, made another attack there so uh, idf actually uh, is fighting in two fronts now the home front against the covid 19 and the regular front which is defending us keeping the deterrent against hamas uh, making sure that there are no uh, strategic uh, problematic shipments into Syria from Iran, uh, etc. I would uh, love if each of you will say a few last words just to uh, uh, close this discussion. Uh, Ilan, let's begin with you. As I said in the beginning, a, a cooperation is needed all around the world. It's not a time and not an era of uh, challenging one another. That's first and basic uh, thinking and I think that uh, everyone should think like that otherwise we will be in a world much more bigger world crisis. The second issue as you said Israel knows to defend itself on the borders and to fulfill its uh, interest inside the country. We know to do that we are doing it I think that we are doing it quite well. The third issue is the cooperation with the Palestinians. It's important. It's a crucial one. It's, it's a strategic one. Uh, they are suffering from the, 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 the coronavirus. We are suffering and only a good cooperation will uh, help us to overcome and to go forward. And I think that both of the sides understand that and it's good. And the fourth issue is that we should keep an eye, open eye, all around our borders, especially to the uh, Lebanese and Syrian uh, border, and of course to the Iranian interest to reach the nuclear uh, bomb. I think that we are doing it. I'm sure that we are doing that. And as you said, if someone will try to burn our edge of our fingers, we will know how to react. We could have seen it by the attack in uh, in uh, homes, in the uh, base, uh, Air Force base in homes. So everyone knows that Israel can deal with those two elements and to do it uh, in a good way. And I think by that, there is a good deterrence for the coming period. And I'm optimistic regarding this issue. I'm less optimistic regarding the fighting of the corona all around the world, the big issue, we are still inside, deep, deep inside uh, this tunnel and we don't know how we will get out. And that's the big challenge and we should understand that. Um, from, a, from an American view, I think one of the things Israelis should um, think about in regarding specifically Iran is a growing uh, wing of our progressive um, electors who are looking to fight against, uh, to ask for all the sanctions to be removed from Iran in the name of uh, the Iranian catastrophe um, uh, with, with the COVID virus. Um, what is not known, and I went through some statistics here, is that um, Iran has 300 billion in currency reserves, 100 billion in sovereign wealth, and Khomeini in his private I think it said that cooperation is 200 billion, $600 billion um, that has not been touched yet. So I really believe um, that needs to be emphasized 
um, to the world, and the only part of the world that makes a difference is to the Americans from this perspective, that Iran is choosing some of its own self-destruction and the growing power of that movement to, is to keep an eye on because anything that, uh, that people will say in the post-COVID time that maybe can lower the flames there to avoid America to go back in, being sanctions relief, um, is gonna ha it's going to have a growing uh, group of people, if not a majority. It certainly won't be while President Trump is there, but with the President Biden administration, it could be. Uh, last thing I'd like to say is regarding Alon's point, I think thinking out of the box and looking at opportunities is what Israel is really good at. You know, we're dealing first with the Israeli, maybe going to a fourth election. Um, Abbas is an octogenarian and, and, you know, and who knows how, you know, he's not in good health. There are going to be opportunities and in some unlikely places, but Israel is going to have to deal with the Palestinians. The questions here, though, of, of throwing things into chaos, the annexations, um, how can you, you know, what can you do to lower the flames or take advantage of the opportunities? That's for Israel to decide. But I do believe there are some opportunities here um, to move things in a more positive direction, not cure things, but basically treat some issues. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ilan and Eric. I was honored, and I think this is uh, extremely interesting to see how many different opinions we have when we try to analyze the future. Uh, sometimes we feel that this is, as Ilan said, a game changer. Sometimes we feel that it's going to undermine the stability in the Middle East, but sometimes we feel it maybe it's just going to accelerate processes that uh, were already going on. And, uh, Actually, it's really difficult uh, for now to understand exactly where all of this is going. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we will meet again next Monday. We're going to have another interesting panel. Uh, we will uh, introduce, we will talk about the holidays, Passover, Pascha, Ramadan. This is the month of the different holidays and different sects in Israel. Uh, how do you celebrate holidays in times of the corona? Again, I will invite everybody uh, to like our Facebook page as well, so we can offer you more. Uh, all the best here from Alma Center. Thank you, Ilan and Eric, for being with us today. I hope to see you, you. soon, Israel, and all this event, uh, Eric. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.